my name is Joe Jankovic. Uh, we are here at Buenos Aires uh, attending the uh, 14th Inter International Congress uh, on Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders. It is my pleasure and honor to interview this afternoon uh, uh, Dr. Stanley Fahn, uh, who is one of the founders of the Movement Disorders Society and uh, someone I have a high regard for and consider him as one of my uh, closest friends and my mentors. So Stan, I uh, just want to start with uh, uh, some introductory uh, remarks and, and questions about your background. Can you just tell me a little bit about your training uh, and your background uh, before you got interested in neurology and, and movement disorders? Sure, Joe. First of all, I'm very grateful that you're interviewing me because I agree with you. Uh, we are close friends and it's very nice to chat with you like this and uh, I enjoyed having you as our student uh, and I felt responsible for your training and movement disorder, so uh, it's really great to have you as the interviewer. Uh, well, I come from California, Sacramento, California. I went to public school, uh, public university, University of California, Berkeley, then uh, UCSF Medical School, and I came back east at that point to uh, do my further medical training. I did a rotating internship at Philadelphia General Hospital, and while there, uh, I decided to go into neurology. I had always liked neurology. I, I loved neuroanatomy. I was only guy in the class that got 100 on the neuroanatomy exams. I really fell in love with it, but I was thinking, what's neurology? It doesn't do much. I should be a neurosurgeon. And so I was thinking, before I make a decision to go to surgery, or not, I'll just take a rotating internship and decide and during internship year. And right away in the first year, I was on psychiatry rotation. and the, the, attending the psychiatrist talked about psychiatric conditions and was talking about the involvement of the brain and things like that. And I got back to neurology and thinking this is for me, medical neurology. So I applied to different institutions, Houston Merritt, Columbia University's Neurological Institute took me. Uh, it was an inter interesting interview process because I, I applied, I didn't hear from them, I know you needed to have an interview, at least I was thought that. So I went there and walked around the wards and uh, on one weekend and the guy uh, who was the chief resident at the time on, the, on that service said, uh, you need an interview. So Charlotte, my wife, was still in Barnard. It was a senior uh, class at Barnard. And I asked her, could she stop off at Dr. Merritt's office and see if I can get an interview? So she went to Dr. Merritt's office one day after school. Merritt wasn't there, but his secretary, Betty Fisher, was there. And so was uh, Bob Fishman, one of the young attendings. And uh, Charlotte said, well, can he have an interview? And Bob Fishman says, yeah, look at his rec my, he looked at my record and said, yeah, Betty, give him an interview. And that's how I got interviewed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From there I got accepted. And I was a resident. And uh, I got interested in neurodegenerative diseases while a resident. And uh, I even went in my elective uh, months in my third year, took some courses in biochemistry and uh, physical chemistry and, and be prepared and then I took, after finishing my residency, I went to Bethesda, the NIH, to do a training in neurochemistry. Uh, I thought the future for looking at neurodegenerative diseases is to study the brain, the chemistry of the brain, and uh, I did microchemistry. I thought that would be the way to go. And while there, I was put on a task of sodium, sodium potassium ATPase, uh, the electric organ of the electric eel. And I wrote some papers, got published in Science, got published in uh, Journal of Biological Chemistry. And uh, I was spent three years at NIH. It's time to get a job. And uh, I was offered a position at Duke. And Meliar came down. He had just gotten a big grant on Parkinson's disease uh, to make, form a center at Columbia back at Neurological Institute. And he was one of the uh, mentors. Uh, in, in neurology for me at, at Neurological Institute. And he offered me a job. And uh, I was concerned, you know, here I was, I was working electric organ. I know nothing about Parkinson's disease. I, am I, do I have to do Parkinson's disease research? Can I do any other kind of research? He says, as long as it's central nervous system research and not muscle research, you can have this lab. So I took the job. Uh, I didn't want to live in the South. I uh, went back to New York and uh, and then I, got involved with Parkinson's. I can tell you that story too, but if you have any other questions in the meantime, <laughs> before I get into it, because how I got involved with Parkinson's and the basal ganglia is another story. 
Well, you know, Parkinson's disease and movement disorders uh, is one area of neurology that requires uh, observation and, and clinical examination. And uh, one of the things I have admired about you is uh, your power of observation and uh, picking up all the nuances of uh, movement disorders. So how did you learn that? Or is this something that uh, just came naturally to you? Or was there a mentor uh, that you admire, that you learn from? Uh, to, to make this uh, a power of observation and uh, then use that to make your clinical diagnosis and, and make all these observations about uh, the phenomenology of movement disorders? Well, the phenomenology, <laughs> which is what I really, I think I tend to specialize in today, uh, I didn't start out that way. Uh, I was still a, a neurochemist. I had a research lab and I had to go to general neurology clinic one afternoon a week. Uh, I also went to the Parkinson Clinic an afternoon a week, and, uh, but I was really basically in the lab. Uh, but what turned me on to the, to, I'll say basal ganglia first before I talk about movement disorders, because that term wasn't invented at the time I was, this period I'm talking about. It was 1965 that I went to the Neurological Institute to start out as an instructor in neurology with my own research lab uh, with money supplied through Melyar and the NIH. And I was working, I bought electric eels, I was working on, the, again, still on sodium ATPase. But then in September of 1965, no, maybe it was November of 1965, the month is important, uh, there was a, the first international symposium on the basal ganglia uh, that I, at least I'm aware of, at least on the physiology, pharmacology, and biochemistry of the basal ganglia. And Mel Yar, Lucian Cote, David Nachmanson, uh, Mimo Costa were the four heads of organizing that. And I knew nothing about the field, but I went to the, I sat through the two day symposium. And uh, the thing that turned me immediately onto basal ganglia was Ole Hornikevich's talk. This was 1965. Now, he had discovered deficiency of dopamine in the basal ganglia in 1960 in his first paper. But I really wasn't un, really unaware of all that. But I heard him speak, and I, I was so turned on to the biochemistry of the basal ganglia. Look at what, what he discovered. And there were other people there, Fuchs and Carlson and many others uh, who I listened to. But it was really Hornikevich that got me interested, because I was interested in the chemistry of disease. And Hornikevich was doing chemistry of disease. So after the, the symposium was finished, I went to my colleague Lucian Cote, who had another lab, and he was working on something else. I told him I was really interested in it, and I want to study the biochemistry of the basal ganglia, and try to figure that out. Would he be interested in joining me so we can go much faster? So we divided up the work. We learned the new assays, how to measure GABA. Uh, we, measured, we already had the assay for sodium potassium ATPase, but we looked at acetylcholine <coughs> esterase and colon acetyl transferase enzymes, and we mapped out the basal ganglia. We were the ones that show high levels of uh, at least the dopamine system and the GABA system, the substantia nigra, among other things, and the globus pallidus had a lot of GABA. And uh, we were very excited. Uh, and it was, when we were doing that kind of work and we finished it, uh, there was a, at the time the Montreal Neural, uh, World's Fair was going on, and Andre Barbeau organized an international symposium on Huntington's and other basal ganglia disorders. Uh, it was mostly about the genetics uh, that he was interested in. And uh, we, Lucian and I went, and we gave a paper on the substantia nigra, uh, showing how it was a dynamic, the one nucleus in the brain that had the highest activity in GABA and tyrosine hydroxylase. And uh, while we, after we finished our paper, and at the break, uh, a fellow named David Morrison came up to us. And I didn't know David at the time, but he had worked. He was younger than me. He had worked on the substantia nigra as a medical student. That was his thesis. And he, his thesis showed that the substantia nigra grew in stature through phylogeny. In other words, as the animal species developed further and further along, the substantia nigra was bigger. But there was also neuromelanin. And neuromelanin was considered a waste product. No one knew what the neuromelanin did, and David Marson's thesis was this: this is the big waste deposit, the garbage can of the brain, and there's more, and it has no activity just to dump this neuromelanin in there. And so when he heard our story about how all this enzyme activity was there, he was struck dumb. 
he came up to us, he wanted to learn more. And that, that night, the three of us, Lucian, David, and myself, went out to the World's Fair, took rides on the roller coaster and many other rides. We had a great time together. Mm -hmm. We got to know each other. And uh, that started our friendship with David. Uh, well, we continued our way. David went back to London, and we went back to New York. And uh, then my one of my uh, mentors at Columbia was uh, Louis P. Rowland, Bud Rowland. And Bud was given the chair at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and he took it, and he asked if I would go with him, but he, he wasn't ready for me yet. He had to get a grant and to get a lapse going. And would I wait a year and come with him? And I said, I would give it some consideration, because when he went there, Milton Shy left NIH to come, or left Penn to come to Columbia, so it was a real switch. And uh, Milton Shy wanted me to stay and, and, and so forth. But then Milton died uh, one month into his uh, chairmanship at Columbia. Sudden death, heart attack, found dead in his office early one morning. Uh, and, uh, and Dick Maslin took over as chairman, and I decided by then that I would go with Bud to Penn. Uh, when I went by the time I left Columbia to go to Penn, this was 1968. In 67, the paper by George Scott just came out about D.L. Dopa and Parkinson's disease. New England Journal was a major breakthrough, revolutionary advance, really, uh, about people getting better with this high dose of D.L. Dopa. And Mel Yar was running the Parkinson clinical unit. Roger Duvazan was one of his uh, leading uh, assistants. Uh, Roger went out to, to Long Island to see uh, George Cotches' work, recognized the dyskinesia that people have, told George about it. George was not a clinician. He was a pharmacologist, basically, uh, but a, trained in, in medicine. He had an MD. Uh, and he came back. Uh, Roger came back home and said he got all these dyskinesias. And that was really true that this really works, uh, the L-DOPA. And the, so that time, Mel Yard decided, let's get L-DOPA. In the meantime, that was what George Scotch was doing. He, he got L-DOPA, uh, uh, which got rid of some of the side effects from the L-DOPA, and he used half the dose. And uh, while George was publishing another paper in 1968, the follow-up paper with L-DOPA, Mel Yard was doing L-DOPA double, uh, double blind trial at the Columbia Group. Uh, Peggy Holm was one of the other people, uh, Bob Barrett, M Myrna Scher, and uh, Roger Duvozan. Uh, I was not a clinician then, I was in the lab, uh, so, but I was interested in what they were doing and everything, and L-DOPA was working. And so when I was ready to leave in 1968 to go to Penn, uh, I told Dr. Rowland, well, I would like to start uh, L-DOPA uh, treatment. And so we, I went to Penn, uh, I teamed up with uh, Gabriel Schwartz, a senior cl clinician there. Uh, he was interested in it too. And the, and he had some of money that from his practice, and he was willing to buy L-DOPA from the chemical house, get it packaged into capsules, uh, and then sell it to the patient. So we made a little profit each time in, in order to buy more L-DOPA. And we did that. We, we were the center at that time in Philadelphia, bringing in a lot of patients. Uh, so we were one of the early groups, I mean, obviously Yar and Cotsius, but also others, Charlie Markham and others and other institutions. Uh, uh, and we're doing the same thing. Harold Kowan, for example, in Chicago and so forth. Uh, and so we and we published some of our work at that time. But I got experience with L-DOPA uh, right then and there. And while I was a clinician at that time, I was doing the work in the lab, but also running this trial uh, in L-DOPA. Uh, I became interested in uh, other movement disorders, but we didn't have a name for movement disorders. When Dr. Rowland asked me to start a Parkinson clinic, after, shortly after I joined, I told him, uh, because I was already, we already knew about dyskinesia and dopa, that there was a connection between abnormal movements and Parkinson's, and the dopa makes a Parkinson a kinetic person to a hyperkinetic person. So I uh, told Bud, look it, I, I would run the clinic, but I don't want to call it the Parkinson clinic. The Parkinson clinic was already at the Neurological Institute. The only other Parkinson clinic there was in the United States, maybe even the world, was at Mass General. Um, and they were the two. Uh, uh, so uh, that, that was a, we had to come up with a name for the clinic. Uh, and we, we, we sat, just like we're sitting now, uh, next to each other, and we're chatting about them, we're trying to come names. And Bud came up with the idea, well, why don't we just call it movement disorders? I said, that's it, movement disorders. 
We <coughs> called it Movement Disorders. And so we started the Movement Disorder Clinic. Uh, and in a year or two while I was there, uh, I was asked by the American Academy of Neurology to take over one of the full-day courses that they had at the Academy uh, that was run by Tom Chase for several years called Neuropharmacology. And I wrote back said, I'll take over the course, but I want to, since most of the work that was being discussed at that course in the past it had to do with Parkinson's in Korea and things like that, uh, I would like to call it movement disorders and not neuropharmacology. They agreed, and so movement disorders finally got on the the list of courses, and eventually the word got taken up by other people, and so it became mm -hmm. standard. Now we have a movement disorder society. So, Stan, you just told me about uh, your transition from a basic scientist to a clinician, and how the term movement disorder originated, you know, between you and Bud Roland, and uh, and I just wanted to then ask you a little bit about the history of the movement disorder society, because you are obviously, you know, one of the founders and. Uh, how did you reconnect with David Marsden, and how did the two of you then start to think about uh, creating a movement of the society? Right. Well, what happened was um, when I was at Penn seeing patients and, and seeing other movement disorders, in fact, I saw dystonia, and I began to think about dystonia and why did uh, acute dystonic reaction respond to anticholinergic. It gave me the idea of why not we try anticholinergics in dystonia and build the dose up slowly, just like George Gotch did with Parkinson's and L-DOPA, and that seemed to work for dystonia, and I, that was very enthusiastic, and I was seeing Koreas, and I, and I tried drugs to treat Koreas. I said, what is the drug that causes Parkinsonism? It was neuroleptics. I said, let's do a, do a neuroleptic trial on, on Sydenham, Korea, and Huntington's Korea, and other Koreas, and we did that. Uh, so I was getting involved a lot clinically. At the same time, I was running a, a, a lab. I did work on the autopsies on the brain. I mapped out the distribution of enzymes and dopa in, in the human brain, and uh, it's more or less what uh, was done by uh, Ole Hornikevich, but I, I, I mapped out the, the distribution along the putamen, for example, and the caudate. Uh, but at, during all this time, I was working in the lab and seeing the patients in the clinic, uh, I was getting interested in the phenomenology, uh, how to separate different kinds of movement disorders. And it was just at that moment that David Marsden comes back to my life. Uh, he had been in London, and he be was be going to be appointed a professor at the Institute of Psychiatry, the professor of neurology, Institute of Psychiatry. They were decided to have some neurologists there. And his labs weren't ready. And while he was, he had time to kill. Basically, he decided to come to the United States and and sit in with different people and, and make a tour around. He went to Roger Duvozan first, uh, and uh, who was then at Mount Sinai, uh, at Columbia, uh, still with uh, Mel Yar, and then he came to Penn. So and he spent about a week or so with, with us at Penn, and he came to my clinic. And we would see patients together. And we saw all these interesting movements. What do we call this movement? And, and it turned out David and I saw eye to eye. This, this is a, what Korea looks like. This is what athetosis looks like. These are her tremors. This is dystonia. And even though there's some jerky movements, we saw the repetitive nature and we said this is dystonia. So we were beginning to see the phenomenology and agreed upon it. Uh, and so what uh, I've been. David, of course, left. They made his other tours, uh, and I was running this by myself. And of course, I was still running the movement disorder course at the academy. And uh, in 1973, Bud Rowland was asked to go back to Columbia and be the chairman there, and he asked me to go with him. And again, it was a tough decision. I had to uproot my family and everything, but I wanted to go uh, back with him. And I had a lab. And uh, I also asked for a parking space. I had a parking <laughs> space. Uh, and I had Mel Yar's office, because Mel Yar was going to leave and become the chairman of Mount Sinai, and I was going to run the Parkinson unit uh, at Columbia. Uh, so that was a step up. And uh, so I went back to Columbia and uh, changed the Parkinson Clinic's name to Movement Disorder Clinic. Uh, and uh, again, to uh, not only see patients, but run my lab there. Uh, it was while I, I was at Columbia that uh, I got uh, some an information about uh, st thinking about starting a journal and, and showing videotapes. Um, 
And how, how did that come about? Well, what happened was I was a member of the council of the American Neurological Association, and I was sitting in and I was looking at their meetings and seeing the finances, and they had a journal, Annals of Neurology, uh, and uh, I saw how much money was coming in. It was like $90,000 a year. I said, gee, if you can have found a journal, we, we got to start a journal. In the meantime, uh, publishing companies were looking to start a journal in the field, and I at that, I forgot the exact year, I think it was 1985, and April 85, uh, at the American Academy of Neurology meeting, uh, I, I met with David. I told him the idea of a journal that we shouldn't let a publishing house do it. We should start a society, let the society make the money. It should stay in academic neurology, interest to the people interested in movement disorders. And David thought it was a great idea, and he said, but the other thing we should do if we have a journal is have it with videotapes. So that was David's idea. So we decided, how are we going to start a society? And the first thing I did was, because it was a meeting of the uh, World Federation of Neurology Extra Primal Research Group that was going to take place in June in New York in 85, uh, that I would put a flyer out, and I photocopied it, uh, asking people would they be willing to join a Movement, a new society, Movement Disorder Society, with dues of about $110 a year, which a, 10 would stay with the society, but 100 would go with a, for a journal, and we would have a journal. How many are interested? And I got everybody that responded to those, and there was over a couple, well, maybe not 200, but a, over 100 flyers I left out there in the chair. They, I got, got them back. They all wanted to do it. So I, how to start the society, that was the next step. So. I thought of what we need is a founding group of people, well respected in the field of movement disorders, uh, and that we could meet together uh, at the meeting in Hamburg uh, later that year in the fall of 1985. Uh, there was the, I think the uh, World Congress of Neurology was going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was going to go, and, mm -hmm. and so I invited to have three Americans and three Europeans uh, who are respected. Uh, the Americans were you, Joe, I invited you, and Ira Schulson and myself. And for the Europeans was David Marsden, uh, Andrew Lees, and Eduardo Tolosa. So the six of us are going to meet in my hotel room uh, one evening and see if we can agree upon that and how, how should we move it forward. Uh, it turned out that Ira Schulson couldn't come that night. So it was just the five of us without him. We all agreed, and then when we all finally finalized it all, and I can tell you what the details were in a minute, but uh, you had your camera with you, which you always do, mm -hmm. and you said, let gets to take some pictures. So you, we set it up, so it would shoot by itself. We had nobody else to take the picture, and you guys sat on the sofa, and I set the camera and ran around to the back of the sofa, and just in time for the picture to snap. And that's a classic picture now of the founding fathers of the Movement Disorder Society. Uh, the next day, we, we picked up who should be on the editorial board, I was asked to be the, uh, the uh, not the president, but the uh, head of the steering committee. We'd be the steering committee. We wouldn't have a president until we had an actual uh, constitution and bylaws. And uh, so we would begin slowly, start with the journal, incorporate ourselves. Uh, I set up the paperwork to incorporate. I, would, I did the negotiating with the Raven Press to set up the journal. And they would pay, pick all the expenses until they'd make profit, and then they'd get their money back, and then we'd get we would share the profits after that. It was a 50-50 split, just as we envisioned. And so that was 1985. We wanted the journal to start right away. I, when I got back home to New York, I met with Raymond Press. Alan Adelson was the head of it. Uh, and we, and my, it turned out my wife was working at with Raven Press, so I knew, the, knew Alan very well. And um, we set these terms together, and we started the journal. And it was going to be a quarterly, a small size uh, uh, production. That is, the, the, the size of the journal is going to be small. Mm -hmm. And it was tough going at the beginning. I got an editorial board. The editorial board was supposed to send their papers in and get this thing going. Uh, this, the first issue was going to be in 1986. And we were just at the end. You know, it was January through March, but we, by the end of March, the first issue comes up. By the end of June, the next issue, we, we were way behind in getting it done. And I had to nag people and coach people. To get, and a lot of people came through, and some people didn't. Uh, and. Uh, I remember our first editorial board meeting. We had no money in the bank, uh, and we, we so we set up a, a arrangement that uh, 
we, we did have these subscriptions. We had a movement sort of society by then. Uh, we had about 100 people or maybe a little bit more by then. Uh, we had an editorial board meeting. I think that was in New Orleans that we met, the first editorial board meeting. Uh, I think you were on the editorial board, uh, among others, Eduardo and so forth. Uh, and uh, But I, we had no money to pay for the dinner, so it was a potluck dinner. We all paid for ourselves. We shared the price of the dinner. Uh, of course, David and I were co-editors, uh, Eastern Hemisphere and Western Hemisphere, and uh, we got no salaries. Our secretaries that we had, we, we just gave them the extra work to handle the manuscripts. And it was all seat of the pants, uh, working diligently at it and getting the manuscripts in and getting them out. Uh, and of course, it grew and grew, and the society grew and grew, and uh, it was great. By the, and then for the Movement Disorder Society, we needed a constitution and bylaws, and I thought the model would be for the American Academy of Neurology's bylaws and its constitution. And I asked Gerald Stern, who was very uh, eloquent in his language, the English language, I always admired the way he speaks so clearly and everything. I asked him, here's the constitution, the bylaws, the academy, would you see if you can fix something up that models this for the Open Source Society? And he did. He sent it back, and I did some editing of it, and we got it approved. The first meeting of the Movement Disorder Society membership uh, was, uh, I guess it was a year later, I can't remember the exact year, 1987 maybe, uh, and that was in Jerusalem, uh, or it was Tel Aviv, I guess. Tel Aviv. It was, again, the World Federation of Neurology Extraprimal Research Group, I think, was meeting. And uh, we, we had to vote on the Constitution and bylaws, and then if that passed, we had to vote on officers. And uh, I was still head of the for three years, I was heading uh, the steering committee, uh, and I had asked, uh, I think it was you or Ira, uh, to head the nomination committee, Ira Schulson, uh, and, picked, and so I was nominated or picked by the committee to be president, and David Marsden to be president-elect. And in those days, it was going to be, I think, uh, th we we're going to do a three-year uh, tenure uh, every three years to rotate, and uh, Bob Burke, I know, was going to be secretary. And so, and so it started out that way. Maybe it was two years. I can't remember the, the details now. I have to look at the old notes. But uh, and the, subsequently, when we merged with ISMD, which is International Society of Motion Disorders, uh, which was mainly a European group, uh, we negotiated keep, a merger, keeping the name Movement Disorder Society, keeping our democratic structure with the Constitution and bylaws, but changing to two years and having uh, extra officers of a president-elect, not only the president-elect, but a secretary-elect and treasurer-elect, and that's how the current status is today. And we had five, a 10-member International Executive Committee. That was from the, I think, from the beginning, uh, with rotation off after every two years, uh, but they can be re-elected. And there will be alternate terms, and so they're not all 10 of them elected at the same time, but every two years another five would be elected. And that's how uh, the society started to take off and grow. And then when my term was over, uh, David was president-elect going to president, and he expanded more committees and things like that. And you were then named, also nominated and elected as the next president-elect to be taking the third presidency after David. Uh, and uh, so you've been involved from the very beginning of the society as well. Uh, and now, if I can, I just want to talk about how we started together. Uh, because I was a young attending at the Neurological Institute. Uh, this was in the, I came back in 1973. Uh, and you, within a year or two, you were a resident there. And, and when I was having our movement disorder clinic, I would only accept third year residents into my clinic. I, I said they had to know general neurology first, and then in the third year they can come, and they have to spend at least six months because you can't see a patient and forget about the patient. You have to follow that patient up, and at least six months is needed. Uh, and I had that policy in place for a couple of years, and then you came along as uh, you were going to start finishing your first year. You wanted to start already moving sort of clinic in your second year. And you, I said, no, it's the third year, and you talked me into it. Uh, so you became the first of the second-year residents to come to our clinic, and you came every Tuesday for two years. Uh, it wasn't just a six-month thing with you. And not only that, but you encouraged me see, uh, to have uh, rounds in the hospital and have the residents come on rounds. 
what we were doing up to that time, we had our movement disorder clinic on Tuesday afternoons, and it still is Tuesday afternoons today. Uh, the residents would rotate through it. Of course, the attendings would be there. Uh, and then when the clinic was over, I would make rounds in the hospital with the rest of the movement disorder attendings and see all of our patients in the hospital and see any other consuls that were there for that, that came in that week. Uh, and you suggested, why don't you just open it up and let the residents come? And so from that point on, we had the residents uh, join us in movement disorder conference uh, making rounds. And um, so I appreciate uh, your input on that, and that was very good. And the clinic is uh, still going strong. Uh, I began to have fellows for the first time, I think it was 1981, maybe 1980. I had a major donor, an oil man, uh, who do gave us $250,000. I decided to start a fellowship with that. And I think Bob Burke and Avi Rekas uh, came, uh, he got money for them. There was also a, f a f uh, neurologist, pharmacologist from China. The, the uh, Cultural Revolution was just over. And this guy was a professor there, and he was sent to the rice fields for three years. And when he came back to the university to run the do neurology there and do research in the lab, uh, they said, you know, you go overseas for one or two years and get some training, bring up yourself up to date. So he asked to come to my lab, and they provided the money. So we took him. He was in our lab. Uh, so it was a great group of people, and uh, Steve Gallant was another first-year fellow uh, then. and. Uh, so, and then the fellowships continued to grow since then. And I've had many great fellows, um, way over 100, probably close to 140, 150 by now. Uh, many are professors and some are superstars like yourself. Uh, and uh, it's been a great run. This has been an exciting time for movement disorders. Uh, I uh, not only enjoyed it, uh, I, I learned from my fellows, I learned from my patients. And I still love the phenomenology. Oh, let me tell you about phenomenology again, as long as I'm at it. When I was still just coming back to Columbia in 1973, first of all, I, at Penn, I took movies. I had a Super 8 movie that I got from my father, who didn't need it anymore. And I was taking movies of all my patients. And, and I would clip them and show them at the Move Disorder Conference at the Academy, uh, you know, when I'd give lectures about things. And, but when I got back got to Columbia in 1973, when I left Penn, taking pictures there, uh, I asked uh, people in New York City who had an interest in, in the field of movement disorders, how about coming and sharing your interesting movies with us? Uh, so I, I set it up once, it would be once a year, it was in our house one evening after work, uh, and there were people, you know, Roger DeVozan came, Bob Barrett came, uh, Mel Yard was invited but never showed up, uh, Oliver Sacks came. Uh, a number of others uh, from other institutions in New York. And Charlotte made a salad and made a big pot of chili con carne. Uh, I made French bread. I, I learned how to bake bread. Uh, we had a lot of French bread and chili and salad and beer, lots of beer to keep the <laughs> tongue loose. And uh, we ate dinner in our dining room. Then we broke into the living room. I had a projector on the wall. We had a camera, a, a projector. I mean, I had a screen on the wall and a projector shining into it. And uh, we all took turns showing movies. Uh, it was that going on for about three or f well, maybe four or five years at home every year. And when it was really a great time that when, the, when I got on the Education Committee of the American Academy of Neurology, the idea came to me, why don't we have evening seminars where we show cases of interesting things? And, uh, I want to do only unusual movement disorders. I know there could be one for simple ones, regular movement disorders, but I would like a more sophisticated type thing. So there was a two separate uh, after dinner seminars. And uh, I invited David Morrison to be my other partner. Uh, the two of us would do it. And we would bring our own videos, but we'd also ask the audience to show theirs. And so that set up all at the academy, all these case presentations on seminars. Stroke uh, case presentations, neuromuscular presentations, epilepsy ones, and so forth. And, but we were the first with movement disorders. We showed videos. And people like Pill Sethi came. He knew nothing about it, and he learned his movement disorders by being there. And there's a whole, we, we took a lot of people. Initially, uh, the education committee said you can only allow 60 people in in order to have a discussion. Well, people 
were locked out. They didn't, couldn't get a ticket. So after the guards left, they all came in anyway, and they were standing around. And so every year I asked her, well, let's have 80. How about 100? I, mean, I said, what's the reason for any limit? We have pr plenty of discussion. Uh, and Dave and I would banter back and forth and sometimes disagree, sometimes agree. Uh, and it was great. And, and not only that, but that kind of a course taught people what Dave and I were already doing, and this is now in the 70s, uh, uh, about diagnosing phenomenology movement disorders. In those days it was phenomenology, and that also included psychogenic movement disorders and how to distinguish them. Uh, more, more recently, as etiology became more important, as people know their phenomenology, becomes more involved with etiology. What's the etiology of this particular type of Parkinsonism, this particular type of tremor, this particular type of chorea, ataxia, and so forth. But in the early days, it was mostly phenomenology. Uh, and I ran that course for 20 years, um, stripping down. And I asked you and Tony Lang to take over. Uh, you, you two were always at the course anyway. Uh, and then uh, and you, you ran it for a number of years uh, with Tony. And now another generation is doing it. But uh, it, was, it mm. was great to do that. Uh, we met a lot of colleagues and uh, at international meetings uh, before there was a merger with the ISMD and had our own congresses, the Movement Source Society's congresses. There were congresses of the uh, uh, World Federation of Neurology. And they would have an unusual movement session, and I was asked to run those. And so it, it, a lot of people around the world got trained from the, having videos, which, of course, which replaced uh, movies. And we had sound, much easier to edit. And uh, it was very interesting to have all that experience uh, the, uh, working with people and getting to meet a lot of people around the world. Uh, it's, I would say movement disorders as a specialty is one of, I wouldn't call it all, necessarily all close-knit, but very friendly specialty. Uh, you don't see people bickering with each other. I hear about other specialties, they fight all the time, and they split up, and, but we tend to be very congenial with each other, supporting one another, and the whole idea is to advance science, advance help of the patient, and we keep that as on top of our principles and not having any bickering or territoriality. If it's good for science, it's good for the field. And that's my, that's my philosophy, and, and uh, the whole society has had that philosophy. So it's been good. The journal is thriving. The congresses are thriving. Uh, there are committees. There are scholarships. There's so much going on now. It's very hard to keep up with the field. In fact, I'm glad I was in it one at the beginning because I can learn and read everything. Now it's hard to keep up. There's so many journals and and, and movement stores. A journal now is full size. Not only is it all monthly, but sometimes more than one a month. Uh, and it's videotapes. Of course, we had the videotapes from the very beginning. Now it's all digital. So it was uh, been a great time in this field. Uh, Glad to have been a part of it. Well, for, for me, uh, it was also uh, you know, very rewarding. And one of my uh, uh, earliest memories was uh, during my chief presidency when I was following you around, learning the phenomenology from you, also going to your home and, and learning the phenomenology from, from the videos and meeting your wife, Charlotte. And, and I just want to ask you, how do you balance you know, your extremely productive, successful professional life against uh, your personal life? And what advice would you have for young physicians who struggle with this, uh, you know, this, this difficulty balancing their career uh, with their personal life? I would say this takes work and effort. Uh, it doesn't come easy. Uh, each one has its demands. Uh, I love my wife and family, uh, and actually they should come first, but work was always very important to me. In fact, when I first met Charlotte and I told her I really – what I want in my life is I want to see advances in whatever field I'm in and work hard at it and was she agreeable to all that and uh, but at the same time make sure I spend time with with her and the family and I always when the kids were small I always left work in time to have dinner with the kids uh, put the, help put them to bed and bathe them and so forth diaper them when they were babies um, so I was always there and then when they got to bed then I could get to my work read read the papers, write my papers, whatever. Uh, I always ended up doing my writing at home when I had a block of time and you no know, distraction. But it was always that. And and one year I remember we didn't take, I was still a pen, and we didn't take a vacation because I was behind. I had to get something out. And, and Charlotte just told me, she said, you know, 
Penn will love you never to take your vacation. The vacation is owed to you, and you're, if you give them up, you're never going to get it back. So always take your vacation. So I've always taken a vacation. Mm -hmm. Cheryl and I always go away. We don't interrupt it. I was invited this year, for example, uh, in August to go to Brazil at their neurological meeting. The talk it happened to fall in the two weeks of when we usually go away at the end of August. And I said, you want to go to Brazil, Rio, and uh, see Rio? No, I would rather go hiking in the mountains. And so I, I didn't I'd accept it. I explained to him I couldn't go. I mean, this is dedicated time to family. Now, I should spend more time with family, I know, and especially uh, now the kids are out and Charles got more free time also. Uh, and we try to go away on weekends. We try to do a few things uh, to make up the, for my busy schedule. Uh, but it was very important to keep the family intact and not have it broken up. Uh, at the same time, I spent a lot of time with whatever I consider important at work, whether it's the patients or the academic schedule, training. I do a lot of training with fellows. Uh, I enjoyed it tremendously, and uh, I, I think I'm, I'm good. At, I take good care of my patients. I think I do a good job, so I, I, it gives me pleasure. I feel refreshed after that. So it's it's, it's tough. I, I I don't think there's an easy answer. Uh, it, probably, it shouldn't be all or one and not the other. I think it should be a combination, and the, you have to have a spouse who who's agreed to that. You know, you talked about the importance of family life and friendships and. You know, for me personally, the uh, friendship with you and David uh, started actually during the Aspen course. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the history of Aspen course and what that means to you. Yes, the Aspen course. Uh, this is the annual uh, four-day long meeting. Uh, every year it's been in Aspen. The, what's this, our 20th year? This is going to be our 20th okay. year. Okay. So what happened? It dawned on me. Uh, CME was going on and continuing medical education, and uh, I recognized that there was a need for good medical education and movement disorders for uh, people who can all go to the academy and so forth, and so we should start a course. It was also, I thought, as an opportunity not only to spread the message, uh, but possibly to generate some income if it was successful to help our research fund and our training fund and allow travel for the fellows and stuff like that so we can bring some income. And, and uh, so I came up with the idea of this course. Um, and I asked you, who I respected tremendously, movement disorders, and David, uh, to be the three of us doing this course. Uh, and not having a whole bunch of other people coming in and doing it, because we have to pay everybody's transportation, we have to give them an honorarium. There wouldn't be any money left over, it would be a lost situation. And to get CME credits from Columbia, uh, they, they have to make a profit. The CME take, takes their cut, too, the, the, the Department of Continuing Medical Education. So we couldn't take a loss. Otherwise, I was supposed to be personally liable for any loss. So I, I try to keep the expenses down, but I also have one of the best faculty, so it would have been the three of us. And for a number of years until David's death, uh, that we had that course. And um, so we started, what, in two, uh, 1990? Uh, something like that, right? 1990 was the first year. Okay. And so uh, this will be their 20th year. And David died, I think, in 2000. Yes. Uh, and we split up the course. We each did about a third of it. And uh, each one taking their own little thing and becoming developing it thoroughly. Uh, and we shared, we did a syllabus together. And we always wanted to write a book together on that course. And we decided at the time we would take the syllabus as a starting point. Everybody would add their own words to the syllabus. One would be the primary writer for that chapter, but the others would put their input, have their input, and uh, we would come out as a unified textbook. Um, and then David died, unfortunately, before we were set back for a while. Uh, and when David died, we asked uh, Peter Jenner and Mark Allen to pick up some of David's lectures, and you and I each picked up another one of David's lectures. And, and then until a year ago, uh, we thought we could, Peter Jenner's, like Peter did, only did three lectures anyway. Uh, and we could take over his lectures. So between Mark and myself, we just put those lectures up. So now it's just the three of us. And it's been great. I mean, we get a great attendance. Uh, turns out we got support from pharmaceutical companies who want to see young people come into the field of movement disorders. Uh, a lot of people who are movement disorder trainees want to come. 
Uh, and people who are residents and the guys in practice who it was originally designed for want to come and learn movement disorder. So, uh, and we, we had an aspen. Now, why did we pick aspen? Well, that's to you, your credit. But what happened was I was thinking of Lake Tahoe. I grew up in California. I used to vacation in Lake Tahoe. But to get to Lake Tahoe, you have to fly to San Francisco, rent a car, or fly to Modesto or some other city and rent a car, and to get there. And it's an extra schlep in a way. Uh, you suggested Aspen. You knew Aspen. I had never been to Aspen, or maybe once. Uh, and then I agreed. I said, okay, Aspen looks good. They had one hotel that accommodated us at that time, which was the Hotel Jerome. They welcomed us because the summer was rather light. They had, it was a ski town, and they were busy in the ski season. But the summer, they wanted to fill up. So we had the, we always tried to pick the weekend period around the end of July, beginning of August, so that my view was that people go vacation either in July or August, and so it is either the end of vacation or the beginning of the vacation, and this is a, then they can break from there. If they come to Aspen, then they can vacation in the Rockies or in the West or use that as a starting point for their vacation. So I thought that was always a good time, and we still have it uh, around that same time. Uh, and it's still four days, and we trimmed it, and uh, but we expanded the syllabus. It was small, and it's now big. Uh, now it's all digitized. <laughs> now it's on a uh, memory stick. <laughs> uh, so, and then we have a book. The book, first book came out. Uh, the, what started with David uh, and you and I, and then Mark and Peter Jenner added some chapters. That, they really took David's chapters and worked on it, and we added to it. Uh, and then the next year, the next edition, we'll have uh, Mark Hallett as one of the co-authors, uh, being equal footing with us. And uh, I think it's been a very successful book. It had big sales, and uh, that that worked out fine too. Let, let me conclude with the question that I always ask uh, fellow applicants. Uh, I always ask them, "Where do you see yourself ten years from now?" So I'm going to ask you, "Where do you see yourself ten years from now?" Well, let's say I, I hope I'm still alive. I'm having fun. Uh, I'm at an age of retirement, past it actually, but I love what I'm doing. And I think I still do a great job, and I think I still keep a cohesive team together at Columbia. Uh, I, I just don't see myself doing something differently. I, I just, to me, this is great joy. Now, obviously, at some point, I, I have to step aside. Uh, I will probably be retired in 10 years, maybe before that, obviously. Uh, and I will don't know what I'll be doing. I just don't know what I would do in retirement. I'll probably like the garden. I might come into the rounds of the Neurological Institute and uh, see you know, the cases with them or do some teaching uh, and still be around. Uh, and I certainly would spend more time with Charlotte by then. Uh, she probably wants me to retire now and spend more time mm -hmm. so we can travel. And we have now three little grandchildren. That's another thing. We would visit them more and uh, we'll probably do a lot of traveling, I suspect, more than we're doing. Right now, most of my traveling is with meetings, um, and uh, so we'll probably travel without that in the future. Well, we very much hope that you're going to continue to live for many, many decades and will continue to contribute to the field of movement disorders as well as to have the time to spend with your family. And uh, just for me personally, I want to thank you for everything you have taught me and and especially for the friendship that we have shared over the years. And I've learned from you, you too, Joe, so that's, this goes two ways. Well, It's like everything, even my patients yeah. I learn from. It. Everything, you know, you take it in and you get the best. It's like a sieve. You let this things, garbage go out and, and the, the kernels stay behind and uh, that's the fruit. Uh, you should on. never, ever stop being a student, right? Correct. Yeah. Thank you, Stan. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Stan.